You've been hearing how some big brands are winning through simplicity. But don't get intimidated. You can do this too, no matter the size of your team or your budget. Want to learn the six behaviors you can instill to create simple experiences for your customers and your team members? Download a free copy of my simple playbook today. It'll help you immediately turn your customer experience around and create an Amazon experience without having an Amazon budget. Grab your copy of my simple playbook at mattlyles.com slash simple playbook. Welcome to the Simple Brand Podcast, the show dedicated to helping you create simple experiences for your customers and for your team members. Each week, we're bringing you amazing interviews with business leaders and authors who will teach you how to differentiate your business with the one thing your customers need the most, simplicity. Your customers live in a complex world. Let's make it simple. Now, here's your host, Matt Lyles. If we want to provide truly simple experiences to our customers, we have to answer a number of questions. What are my customers' favorite purchases? Where should I focus my marketing dollars? Which channel produces the biggest return? How can I use social media to better engage my customers? And the most successful leaders know where to find the answers in their data. Having a data-driven strategy is imperative to constantly providing the simple experiences that customers crave. But if having a data-driven strategy were that straightforward and simple, every business would be killing it today. The real challenge comes from analyzing, extracting, and understanding the right insights from the data. And there's no better leader I can think of that understands this more than this week's guest, Dan Marks. Dan's held a number of marketing leadership roles in the financial services industry, including CMO roles with both First Horizon Bank and Hancock Whitney. He's received numerous marketing accolades, including the President Circle CMO Award and the Top CMO on Twitter Award. Today, he leads the strategy and marketing team for Infusion, where they help banks and credit unions grow their profits through data-driven programs. I've known Dan for a number of years, and I've loved following his career success. And I'm thrilled that I get to discuss his insights with him today. Hey, Dan, how are you today? Hey, Matt. Great. Good to be with you. Yeah, good to see you again. Unfortunately, uh, you know, nobody else can see you, but I get to see you. (laughs) Dan, you've had a pretty cool career, and you've been able to work for some really great companies. Give me a highlight of your career, you know, where you've been and where you are today, and tell me some of the biggest lessons you've been learning along the way. Yeah, thanks, Matt. I've been blessed with just some of the opportunities I've been given and I guess some of the impact that we've been able to have with the teams I've worked with. So I actually started my career at a small consulting company as part of the sort of the dot-com craze. That firm was named Vention. Went to grad school, Vanderbilt after that. Then I joined First Tennessee, now First Horizon, for a decade and a number of roles starting in a strategy job and analytic job and moving into the CMO slot there. Then went to work for a, a large national retailer for a couple of years. Then was at Hancock Whitney, which is a fantastic regional bank headquartered on the Gulf Coast, joined them as chief marketing officer and had five years of great impact where we elevated the marketing function, drove a lot of data driven and digital and voice of the client efforts to move the brand forward to simplify some things for the customer and have an impact. And I've just joined the last few weeks, a new firm to now take some of that background and help other companies as they apply data to help accomplish their brand objectives. That's fantastic. And you were in some key marketing leadership and CMO roles. But beyond that, it sounds like you've had like really well-rounded experience. And I love the fact how you're pivoting now to kind of take all that you've learned in your career and be able to teach that to others. Yeah, I'm excited about it. And honored to have the chance to serve a number of companies and how they help what they're trying to accomplish. Very cool. Now, one thing you mentioned, and I want to touch on this, is you mentioned taking a data-driven approach and focusing on data quite a bit. And a lot of times, you know, that can be scary, that can be confusing or complex to others, but data plays a key role in decision-making and actions and in how we create customer experiences. So 
tell me more about data and you using data to focus on creating experiences. Yeah, man, what a question. So we really are in the era of the art and science of marketing and brand building and driving profitable revenue. And when I think about kind of the stereotypical sort of madman age, <laughs> you're right. Yeah. And I think that was always a little bit of a caricature with that show. I mean, because even back in the Ogilvy days, there was used research to focus messaging and those kind of things. But that was very much the view of, hey, let's sit around for weeks on end and come up with a ton of ideas and have a big idea and have the impact. But now with the science, the science and the tools have gotten so much better. It's really about focus. And so having a smart approach, and that's where partners can help provide some of that outside perspective. So you're not just thinking about it from your frame of reference, but data and using the right level of data can help you help companies focus on what's most important. Where are they having the biggest impact? Where are they having an impact on their customers? And then that helps focus an action plan. So what are the things they need to focus on from a messaging perspective, from a sales activity perspective, perhaps from a product development perspective to where can they kind of build and get that flywheel moving and perhaps that flywheel spinning even faster to accelerate ultimately the accomplishment of their mission and how they're the impact they're having for their customers, their employees, their shareholders. I love it because a lot of times too many leaders will have the approach of trying to focus on too many things. And then from there, trying to figure out, okay, like what do we need to focus on? How do we simplify things? But still they keep focusing on a broad range and it's kind of a shotgun approach versus a rifle approach, so to speak, and we're really focusing in. So I love how you're talking about being able to use data to help simplify your approach, to help prune it down or prune it back to focusing on just those key things that are going to make the most impact. Yeah. And, and you know, Jim Collins, right, is yeah. talked about the flywheel concept. You talk about simplification. It's one of those things that's really easy to say, but really hard to do in practice because it means saying no to certain things. And so where a data-driven approach can help is it can make it more objective. So if you say, okay, in a number of choices you might have, taking a data-driven approach to say, where am I having the biggest impact? Where do I have the sort of the strongest competitive advantage? Or where do I need to do things perhaps a little differently? But that's where it can make it more objective. And so you say, you know, look, this is, you can take a lot of opinions and then be objective and scientific on where that focus happens. And, and that can manage some of the emotion because we're all emotional creatures as leaders and managers. We all have biases. And so that unique perspective is great for inspiration. But then in terms of making the decision about, all right, where do we go? That's where that data-driven approach and really thinking and then knowing how does it link to performance and then following through and then having a continuous process. So it's a, let's focus and then try things, learn, and then refine over time. Yeah. And then having enough of that data set each time helps you to iterate and refine as you learn. I think it's great how you talk about data helping you to say no, because that is so tough. And that's one of the areas where I see complexity creep in into companies and creep into experiences where you may have a product development pipeline and different leaders have their own bias, their own perspective, and rightfully so. And so all of them are trying to push their key projects, their key goals, and it takes up the pipeline. But then in doing so, to make sure that they can come through the pipeline, everything ends up getting watered down. Or you may have just one product and everybody, all the different leaders are trying to make sure that they put their key goals tied to that product. And instead of having a simple product that you launch, you launch it with too many things tied to it and it can become confusing. But having that data that helps drive those decisions to say, no, this is what's going to make the most impact. And this is where we need to focus. And it's not just somebody else's bias or somebody else's perspective being the one to say no. It's the data that helps make that decision. Yeah. And you know, you're touching on something that's just that's so important, Matt. You can't be all things to all people. And if you try, you're going to be nothing to all people. Exactly. Right? Yeah. 
And that's tough because we are all individuals. We all have our own, like I said, the biases and those kind of things. But when a leadership team can come together and say, okay, now these are my focuses, right? So perhaps it's a customer segment. And you know, one of the things I've talked about over time is focusing on a particular customer segment doesn't mean that you don't want to serve certain segments of the market, right? But it helps you think about where is your focus? Where are you going to concentrate? So the, the analogy I use is if you are, say, from an archery or, or other perspective, if you're shooting an arrow at a target, the bullseye gives you something to aim at. Now, are you going to hit the bullseye every time? No, but you have a target and you have a direction. And so where that applies to brands, I think the target, the retailer has a great example. They have a very defined target client set. I am probably not in that target market, but I still shop there. My wife is probably in that target market and she shops there a lot more. And so that's kind of the power of focus when it comes to a segmentation perspective, because it allows you to really get in and understand, okay, what are the inherent needs and desires and goals of the target that you're trying to reach? And that helps you become the best you can be at serving that particular target's needs and then having the impact along the way. Yeah. And that target segment, that's where you know, that's where you're finding, and that's where the data is showing, where you're going to be able to make the most impact with more ease than trying to reach other segments. So it only makes sense to build your experience, build your messaging, build your positioning, build your brand around that target. And anything else that comes in will be added to that. But to be able to focus on that target, like that's where it's going to help create a much stronger brand. Yeah. And you know, to me, a great example of, and there's different examples, even in industries of focusing, right? Yeah. So in banking, an industry I'm most of my career in or financial services, you have a range of institutions. I've worked from organizations that were very focused on particular geographies. You have Silicon Valley Bank, right? It's very focused on a couple of industry verticals with offices all over the country, but they're very focused on basically the tech sector and the wine sector. I think one of those might be a hobby. But <laughs> other examples is community banks or credit unions are typically very focused on even a smaller niche. And so right. they're fanatical about, you know, one of the things I've always admired is they're usually very fanatical in a good way about credit union might have a affinity to a particular organization or a particular cause. And so the members of that credit union actually feel a greater sense of connection to that purpose. And so that's where their focus is. And then when they, so they take that focus and that mission, and then they can kind of turbocharge it with a very data-driven marketing approach. That's where you can really get that flywheel spinning in a big way. And when you get to that point where you've identified your target and being able to have that specific affinity, then you've got the customers who really identify with that brand and then they start to identify with each other and it just creates even stronger advocacy for the brand. Yeah, that's a great point. You feel like you're part of a community, not just a customer. That's it. Yeah, it's being part of a community. Today, 2020, everybody likes to be identified. Everybody likes to have an identity and one of the best ways that people have an identity is tying their own identity to others, whether that's brands or communities or whatever else. So we get it. Data can help you to simplify your approach and can help you to focus. But in my experience, the actual process, the actual analysis and reporting of data, historically to me, that's always been pretty complex. So tell me about the tension of data versus simplicity and how people can make the data process, the data storytelling process simpler. It's one of those things where data collection, data synthesis, data analysis can be as complicated as you can make it. You work for some big companies. I've worked for some big companies. I mean, they spend the resources on building, just building and cleansing databases are out there. Yeah. But where smaller companies kind of have an advantage these days is they can tap into the right partner that has that expertise that essentially handles a lot of the complexity to them and can bring to bear 
the expertise and the stools and they get it for essentially a fraction of that effort and cost, they can benefit from all that complexity in a very simple manner. So the firm that I'm excited to join specializes in helping smaller companies tap in to the value of essentially big data, but in a very simple way by, you know, we just handle all the complexity for them and let them take advantage of the impact in a very action-oriented way. I think it's having those right partners who have all the tools, all the resources, and all the expertise to help people understand how to use data and how to provide data to make those decisions. Small businesses especially, but I even see it in medium and larger size companies too, where you have people that are working on that data side where ideally you would have the unicorn employee that understands and is able to do everything as far as data collection, data curation, data cleansing, the reporting and the analysis, but also being able to simplify that data story so that the non-analytical people can easily and quickly make decisions and take actions from that. But I have never seen a data team that has those unicorn employees. I do see it with data partners like you're talking about. Yeah. And part of it is because it requires a lot of expertise, right? So it require, yeah. it's kind of a continuous, it's a skill. And so if you're not doing that every day, and that's where also sometimes even in large companies, your perspective is just that company. And so there's values. I mean, there, there's, I've worked with some very talented internal analysis teams, but that's where having the right partner can help augment those and give you sometimes even a multi-organization perspective. So one of the things that we do really well is a opportunity assessment based on a, a huge normative database from multiple perspectives. And we do that in a very in a way that manages confidentiality very well. So nobody ever has to have, we don't even store specific information about named companies. Right. But you get that perspective of, you know, here's what to expect based on, you know, multiple different perspectives that, uh, you know, it's just frankly impossible to get in just an internal situation. So that's just one example of the value of having the right partner to help you have that data-driven perspective. And being able to partner with somebody else helps simplify that experience for you as the business leader. You don't have to worry as much and you don't have to focus on ensuring that your team members have all the right resources and training and expertise and that all that is updated and that you are able to hold on to those employees. So having the right partners to provide that expertise, yeah, that simplifies it for business leaders. So again, you've had a really well-rounded career and background, and you've been able to do some really cool work and lead teams across a number of different initiatives, even beyond, you know, just data. So I'd love to understand from you, when it comes to your work and your leadership, where does your inspiration and where does your creativity come from? So Matt, I'm really inspired by kind of reaching that next frontier. So helping take something that maybe is at point A and needs to get to point B and thinking, applying creativity and saying, okay, we're trying to get to here. What are some creative ways to make that happen? And then what I've also kind of found over time is I would much rather have a chance to kind of course correct along a path and usually applying data and those kind of things, as opposed to spending, say, a year trying to research the best possible answer. I'd much rather take a big audacious goal and then get started, get some reactions, refine that hypothesis, and then keep kind of rinse and repeat. And so situations where there's um, a big goal to accomplish and an empowerment for having the right tools and team. And I've, I've been very fortunate to work with some great teams over my career. You know, culture is super important. And so that's one thing that I've just had some fantastic bosses and teams, and hopefully the folks who work with me are, would say the same thing. And so huge mandate, exciting chance to kind of forge a new path and a chance to work with fantastic teams in different times, either clients or partner with some great organizations. Those are all things that inspire me. Awesome. Yeah. And this is something that I teach to other people is that it's your culture that helps define your operational excellence. You can have all the right processes in place, 
and you as a leader can provide all the right direction and goals. But if your culture is dysfunctional, then you're not going to get the goals. You're not going to get the results that you're looking for as a leader. So yeah, culture is the key to driving that operational excellence. So love hearing you say that. And I also like hearing, you know, how you talk about looking at creative ways and testing and learning and refining as you go along. But if you're anything like me at all, and, you know, I'm on the Myers-Briggs, I'm an ENFP. If you're anything like me, I love that approach. But along the way, I can tend to get distracted. Like I might start going down certain rabbit trails saying, I'm just chasing this idea. And like, oh, what have I get from this idea? And then what does that bring? And what does that bring? And I usually need somebody to pull me back to reality. Do you ever get caught by rabbit trails like that? <laughs> Some great feedback I've had along the way is some of my team say, you know, Dan, I know you have a ton of ideas and I know you want us to have a ton of ideas, but picking the right ones and focus. So that's a skill I've had to hone over time is when you kind of think of the scientific method, right? Right. And this is exciting or the creative method, right? Because it's actually two sides of the same coin is there's a time of ideation. So you come up with a bunch of ideas. And frankly, a lot of times those ideas can happen when you focus on a plan and then you go to a different environment. So you go for, you spend some time in nature, or you go for a run, or you take some time off. So that gives you a new perspective. Anyway, there's the ideation phase, and you come up with a bunch of things, and then you sort of focus on, okay, of the 10 things I thought about, I'm going to actually go do these two or three. Right. And so that's where that kind of continuous learning approach of recognizing there's sort of a time and place for the ideation, there's a time and place for the execution, there's a time and place for the measurement. But having that system, you talked about culture that culture of here's the process is important. And I think that's one of the things that helps with the rabbit trail tendency. Definitely placing a focus on culture and having a defined process in your culture. I also think that it's really important in your culture to make sure that you have the right level of collaboration, making sure that you've got different types of people, different voices, different perspectives. I go back and think to myself, like I'm an ENFP. And I remember some times in my career where I love the ideation phase and I would have 10 ideas and we would say, okay, like we're going to move forward and here's our plan for moving forward. And the very next day I would come back and say, okay, listen to this idea. I've got more. And I was so grateful to be able to have people that were different from me, different from me enough to be able to complement my tendencies, to be able to say, okay, we're going to reel it back a bit, Matt. We've already gone through ideation. Here are our ideas, and, and here's how we're working together to move forward. I was grateful to have that. Otherwise, I would just be creating ideas every day and executing little to nothing. That's right. Yeah, that's well said. And, you know, talking about the culture and the value of diversity and and I think that's where companies or, or organizations that have great culture also recognize sometimes getting an outside perspective is helpful because just like you have your own sort of diverse team inside, you also can augment that sometimes with somebody that helps you tackle something from a fresh set of eyes, right? Oh, yeah. Because um, we all get blinders on. But going back to, I think one of the most important things, the high performing cultures, because we are in a knowledge economy now, right? Yes. It's about, and execution is critically important but also ideation and testing and learning. And so where I've seen very high performing cultures is they kind of embrace that Kanban or continuous learning approach where failures or defects are not treated as witch hunts, right? That they are treated as, okay, that didn't work out like we expected. What do we learn from it? And how do we adjust that going forward? And so that's where you create that, you know, when you talk about high performing culture in the processes, Process is a tool to achieve continuous learning. Process is not a tool to punish people or to trap people or those kind of things. Oh, absolutely not. And what I've seen, and this isn't always the case, but what I've seen is when you've got that process that's focused on the rules and the guidelines that may trap people or that punish people for failures, then people tend to start hiding those failures when they happen. And you've got to be able to have an open, honest, vulnerable culture to be able to share 
where things may have failed or where there's the potential for failure so that leaders can head that off early on before it becomes too late. That's right. We're here in 2020 and you've had experience in financial services for a large part of your career. I'd love to understand from your perspective, what are customers looking for in a banking, in a financial services experience today? It's more complex than ever. And there's definitely some differences between different segments. So on one extreme, you see there's a segment of customers or people, right? I mean, that's what, in the day, we're all people. Yeah. And so whether or not you're making decisions based on your household finances or your own individual finances or a company's finances, there's a group of people that would prefer, and I've, I've never tested this, but you, you mentioned Myers-Briggs, and I suspect there's sort of heavy introvert personalities, but there's a group of people that would prefer to do everything they can digitally and remote. You know, hey, I want to run my banking from my app. I'd rather not talk to anybody live. I can't. So there's that segment. And then there's the segment of sort of traditionalist of I'm either scared or I don't trust technology and I want to do everything in person, old school. And so between those two extremes, there's sort of a continuum of people that want some mixture of Ultimately, I'm trying to achieve my financial goals, right? Right. I'm trying yeah. to operate my life or operate my business and maybe finance a home or invest for my kid's education or my own retirement, or maybe I'm trying to run my business or start it and grow it. And so ultimately, they just want the right level of capabilities to help them get that done. I think the COVID situation has helped people understand that some of the tools you use to accomplish those jobs may have changed. You know, some people really want, kind of crave that in-person interaction. Others have found, oh, you know what? I might have gone through the drive through to deposit a check before, but now I can deposit it through my mobile phone. So it's probably accelerating some of the shift that we've seen over time. So yeah, I'd say, I'd say it's, it's more of just like we've seen in other industries, it's kind of accelerating a shift in behavior based on attitudes than anything else. I think so this pandemic environment, it's really bringing a, a lot of that to light really quickly. And going back to what we were talking about earlier, when brands focus on the most impactful targets, and I hope this doesn't put you on the spot too much. So I'm curious to understand if you're thinking about your customer base and having different personalities or different behaviors, some people really love and prefer the digital experience with as little in-person interaction as possible. And then other people prefer to have, you know, that human connection. So do you think it's better for brands, especially financial services brands, to place a targeted focus on one of those segments or the other, and then really position themselves just for that segment? Or do you think it's better for them to provide two paths to their customer experience, you know, based on your personality, based on your behavior, you can go this route or you can go this other route. So I think that depends on each individual institution and what they're trying to accomplish, right? Yeah. It goes back to the, where is your focus? Where is your, where is your, some of your competitive advantage, what your brand stand for? And kind of at that extreme, you know, like a Silicon Valley bank, right? I mean, they're very focused on businesses that are technology businesses, right? So therefore they don't have many branches. They have a fair number of very focused business bankers and then a lot of technology, right? So that makes sense for their business model. And so I, I don't think any um, bank or financial services or institution or credit union can completely ignore the different aspects of what people expect, but each one will have to make a decision on what their emphasis is, what their mix is, what ultimately is the experience that they're specific targeted customer group, whatever that may be, expects and demands and where they get that competitive advantage and how to do that. Yeah, I think you're right. And that's going to help them provide the most focused and even simplest brand experience to, to their customers. Yeah. And, and that's where the, uh, kind of a data-driven approach can help them. Whether or not it's a voice of the customer data, first-party research to help really understand what's what are the attitudes that their target customers have and how does that vary from the opinions to combine with some very deep behavioral 
information on what are the actual usage activities and those kind of things. And kind of taking that full 360 degree perspective can inform those decisions and help each institution make the right decision for their brand, their goals, their market area, their target market, and those kind of things. Yeah, absolutely. That data is really going to help leaders to make better decisions on where to focus and make better decisions on how to define and develop their customer experience. So in your new role, you're going to be teaching a lot of different businesses based on data analysis, but you're going to be teaching them how to better run their business and how to make better decisions. So in that, I'd love to know from you, where do you see opportunities for businesses to provide more simplicity? It really goes back to that kind of focus decision. So we've seen more and more headlines and people talking about, hey, I'm drowning in data. And kind of the analogy is like oil. Crude oil is not very useful by itself. And there's barrels and barrels of it, super tankers of it. But it's the refining process that makes it a usable product. And so every business has got to sort of decide, all right, where do I focus? Where do I refine? Where do I put the calories? Where am I going to dig deep? And then how did that fit my revenue flywheel? And in some ways, that means having the courage to go against the pack. Some of the best brands in history, like Amazon's a great example here, right? They looked at their data and said, okay, one of the sticking points we have in our customers, and this is all public information. You can read case studies about it. We looked at the information and shipping was one of the kind of major sticking points. And so what that fed into the insight of Prime, where they said, all right, we're going to come out with a product that for a fixed fee, you can have unlimited shipping. Well, that makes the pure finance people really nervous. Because <laughs> that's unlimited cost potential. They took that insight, they tried it, and then they analyzed the results. Any new product has the potential to fail completely or be spectacularly successful. Most of them are somewhere in between. And as long as you're smart in how much you're investing in, the, in that product, it has a very low sort of systemic enterprise risk of bankrupting the company. So having those experiments, being willing to try things that perhaps seem irrational, but then test it with data and see what happens. So to the rest of that story, Amazon found that actually the total lifetime value of their customers that were prime subscribers went up. So they might have lost money on one particular line item, but when they looked at the total profitability of the groups of customers that were prime subscribers, that was dramatically successful. So that became a catalyst for them to accelerate their revenue flywheel. And so your question was back to focus and where do you kind of unlock the value? I think, and just to use an example where I'm very familiar with is financial services companies have a lot of that same potential. Each one has a unique opportunity, but by employing a perspective that takes advantage of some external perspective, bringing to bear a partner that can help them apply, you know, kind of focus their internal resources and uh, the perspective of an objective outside opportunity assessment, and then put in place strategies that based on that have a high potential to help them grow revenue in what makes sense for their segments. But every company is going to be a little different in what specific makes sense for them. Oh, certainly. And I think the key lesson here is to not be afraid of trying something new, not be afraid of testing and learning, and recognizing that you don't have to have a lifetime commitment to a particular product or service once you launch it out. You can always refine it. You can always retire it based on what your data is telling you. So key lesson here is data can help you take a lot of risk out of your business. Data can help you make much better decisions and much better actions. I love that. Yeah. Well, Dan, I'm so excited to see where you're now heading in your career. I've, you know, we've been friends for a while and I'm excited to see where you're heading. But today, right now, I would love it if you could tell me, if you were to create a soundtrack for your work day for today, what songs would you include? I'll just tell you the songs that I've listened to so far today. So I started off with Andrew Peterson's Far Country which is oh, a great, nice. great track that helps you sort of kind of get centered on what's ultimately important. Then I moved on to Drew Holcomb's Family, which is yeah. just a fun song. And Drew's a great guy. 
And he's then, here in Nashville too. Yeah, with some common roots in Memphis. That's right. And uh, you two, beautiful day. <sighs> yeah. Then double dose on some Bono. You two still haven't found what I'm looking for. And then Imagine Dragons Thunder, just to keep me young. Keep growing, still keep developing yourself, and still keep searching for what you're looking for, and then bring that thunder. There you go. Dan, thank you so much for your time today. It's been great catching up. I'm so excited for new opportunities, and I look forward to hearing how you're going to be helping more and more businesses. Thanks, Matt. Great to talk to you this morning. Hopefully, this was helpful to your listeners. Absolutely. Love the powerful lessons that are in here. Thanks, Matt. I hope you enjoyed my discussion with Dan Marks. If you're in the banking industry, go check out how Dan and his team at Infusion can help your team become more profitable. You can visit them at infusionmarketinggroup.com. If you're enjoying the Simple Brand Podcast, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. It'll make it a lot simpler for you to get future episodes like the next one featuring the copywriting master, Ray Edwards. Ray's a communication strategist, copywriter, author, speaker, and host of one of the top business podcasts. He's worked with a number of Fortune 500 companies and some of the most powerful names in leadership and business like Tony Robbins, Michael Hyatt, Amy Porterfield, and many more. And I can't wait for you to hear his lessons on simplifying your message through copywriting. So go ahead and subscribe and you'll automatically get Ray's episode as soon as it's live. Until then, keep it simple. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the Simple Brand Podcast. Want to make your listening experience simple and automatically receive each new episode? Visit our website, simplebrandpodcast.com, where you can subscribe to the show in iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. If you're finding value from the Simple Brand Podcast, leave us a rating or review. That helps us get the show to the ears of the people who need it most. Be sure to catch Matt right here next week. Same Matt time, same Matt channel. Until then, keep it simple.